Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you this morning to Saudi United Methodist Church on this fourth Sunday in Advent. We are delighted to have you here with us, and if you are visiting, we are doubly glad for you to be here. Uh, if you need anything while you are with us, just ask someone around you, and they will help you out. So we are delighted to have you here. A couple of quick announcements, thanks to everyone who... Uh, donated towards the African Outreach Orphanage. Uh, I wired uh, $1,000 exactly to Pastor Anthony this week, and he received that and extends his appreciation as well. Our Christmas Eve service will be this coming Saturday, and it will be at 8 p.m., not 9 p.m. as it used to be, 8 p.m., uh, and it will be the same type of service that we've had in the past with some scripture readings and some carols and celebration of the Lord's Supper together and our candle lighting. So next Saturday at 8 p.m. Of course, next Sunday is Christmas Day. Uh, after the service, I will be leaving to go to Virginia to see my parents. Uh, and if you have any special needs during that time between Christmas and New Year's, uh, just let Kathy or Cindy know, and they will take care of you. Uh, poinsettias have been placed on the altar this morning. Please remember to take yours. Uh, if you purchase one at the conclusion of the service, remember to come and get that. Are there any announcements that are not printed that we should be aware of? Pastor Todd. Yes. <laughs> get out uh, um, for anyone who could not make it this past Wednesday for the kids and youth program, it was amazing. I just was so proud of them. They had so much fun decorating cookies and uh, reading the story and acting out the parts and singing some Christmas carols and having some fun with, with the big man in a red suit. It was really, really fun and so precious. And thank you all for all your contributions. We had so many cookies for decorating that we were able to make eight boxes of kits um, for those in need and um, it was just just an incredible experience thank you so much thank you Catherine anything else and I would ask you to join me in the opening prayer that is printed in your bulletin let us pray God of the now and the yet to be. We come to this worship service in anticipation and breathlessness. We are breathless from last minute Christmas shopping and family dinner preparations. We are on the edge of time between the barrenness of autumn and the bright white of winter. We are on the edge of expected pregnancy and new birth. We are on the edge of the joy of anticipation and the fear of facing the unknown. We are at the edge of the seriousness of Advent and the joy of Christmas. 
Help us not to fear being on the edge of newness and change. Help us to hear your words of blessing and hope, comfort and peace, so that we may worship you in this time together. Amen. John 1.14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Words, we're surrounded by them every moment of every day. Written or spoken, they're building blocks of verbal communication. The Gospel of John speaks of Jesus as the Word of God. He is the fullest, most complete, most understandable communication of God's nature and being. Jesus comes to us at Christmas in flesh and blood to show us what God is like. Through Jesus, we are able to see God in a new light and experience Him in a new way.
Why did God do that? Because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The theme for this fourth Sunday in Advent is love, and we receive its fullness through the, through the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. With the candle of love aflame, our Advent journey is almost over. The waiting is almost done. Soon we'll receive the greatest gift, love given freely, that we might be all what we were created to be and, that, and all that God knows we can be. Let us pray. Word of God, word made flesh, let your love wash over us this morning, gentle as a flowing snowflake, warm as a summer's night. Let us receive this love with humility and joy. For God comes soon to dwell among his people. Amen. Our opening hymn is page 245. We invite you to stand as you are able.
Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and the dead will live again? The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Oh, Mary, Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations. Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? This sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. Oh, Mary, he's the great I am. Saudi United Methodist Church, each Sunday we like to just take a moment of silence where we can each lift up our own joys and concerns in the quiet of our hearts. We live in a world with so much noise that we often don't get a chance to just sit in God's presence and be still. So let us go to him in prayer and you may lift up your concerns quietly. Meditate also upon this passage from John chapter 1, verse 14. So the Word became flesh and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So the word became flesh and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. Thanks be unto God. Amen. We invite our ushers to come forward at this time and we shall return God's tithes and our offerings.
be seated. We would like to invite our children and youth, if they will come down to the front for uh, Kathy's devotional time. It's a new TV program, Kathy's Devotional Time. <laughs> Good morning. How are you guys? Getting ready for Christmas, aren't we? Yeah. I was at the mall yesterday just doing a little last minute shopping, and I noticed a group of people off to the side, and there was this guy sitting in this chair, you know, big guy, red suit, white trim, had a white beard. I think his name was um, Santa Claus. His name was Santa Claus. But seriously, folks, I got to thinking, there was lots of people crowded around him, and I got to thinking, you know, there are a lot of people who think that Christmas is all about Santa Claus, but we know who Christmas is really about, right? Speak up. Who's Christmas really about? Jesus, that's right, that's right. But still, I thought it would be kind of fun to just do a little comparison this morning. We're going to compare Santa to Jesus to see who's the best one, okay? So I made a list of a few little, few little things, <clears throat> okay? So number one, first of all, you have to stand in line to speak to Santa, right? But you can speak to Jesus anytime. So who's better, Santa or Jesus? They're saying Jesus. You just can't hear them, but they are saying <laughs> Jesus. Okay, second of all, San Santa only comes once a year, but Jesus is with us all the time. So who's better? Jesus. Uh, then there's, a, okay, Santa fills your stockings with goodies, but Jesus supplies all of our needs. So who's better? Jesus. All right. Santa has a belly like a bowl full of jelly. But Jesus has a heart full of love. So who's better? Say it loud. Jesus. Jesus, that's right. Okay, uh, Santa puts trees under, or gifts under the Christmas tree. But Jesus is the gift. God's great gift to us. So who's better? Jesus. That's right. And lastly, okay, Santa is a jolly old elf. But Jesus He's the king of kings. So who's better? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Well, it looks to me like Jesus has um, beat Santa in every one of these categories. Don't you think? So even though Santa is a fun part of Christmas and we do love the jolly old guy, let's make sure that we do remember that Jesus is the reason for Christmas and the most important part of Christmas, and it's all about Jesus. In fact, Jesus should be all about Jesus every day, right? Right. Let's pray about that. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he is our Savior and the King of Kings. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Jesus is the reason. I had different candy I was going to put in here this morning, but I forgot it at home. I know. It'll be there next time. Ooh. Which one? He's just touched every red sucker in there. There, now he chose the brown one. Good job. Good choice. <laughs> now, the little one's too little for Fruit Loops, right? Okay. Couple more, couple more months. Let us pray. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. This, O oh God, was Your living Word to believers in days of old, and is your promise to all in these days in which we live. From the very beginning was your word, which spoke this world into being. Your word which thunders from the skies. 
Your word which flows like mountain streams. Your word which whispers in the morning breeze. Your word revealed through kings and prophets. Your word praised through angel songs. Your word manifested as a tiny child. Your word alive from the beginning of all things and throughout eternity. As angelic hosts gather to proclaim your message of love for all the world, we gather here this day to hear again of that love brought to life in the holy child of Bethlehem. As Advent nears completion and the blessed day approaches, our waiting will soon be rewarded. Jesus Christ will soon be born. Gracious God, send your blessing upon your church, set apart for the gospel and called to belong to Jesus Christ, that we who have received your grace may bear witness to your love in the world. It's a message that the world is desperate to hear, so enable your church to be the true representation of that love. Grant a sign to our nation and to all in authority that we may not weary you, O God, but rather may stand against evil and choose that which is good. Let the love that comes down at Christmas be carried beyond that day by us. We pray for those this day who long to hear your promise of good news. Lead them out of their darkness and into your light. As we rehear the story of Mary and Joseph, we pray for the Marys and Josephs in every place. We pray for all people who are in the midst of raising children, for biological and adoptive parents, for grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends, for children who long for the love of a parent, for those who will be born this day, and especially those born into hunger and insecurity. Come quickly, O oh God, and rescue those who suffer injustice, oppression, and poverty. Surround those whom we hold dear and those who have asked for our prayers in recent days. We pray for everyone who is in need this day, the lonely, the anxious, the sick, the grieving, and we seek your forgiveness for the sins that we have committed. Cleanse us and renew your spirit within us, we pray. That we may love with the same radical, dangerous, and compassionate love that Jesus showed. For it is in his name that we ask these things of you, almighty God. And share together the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power of and the glory forever. Amen.
invite you to turn to number 219 in your hymnal and stand as you are able. While Barbara's making her way down here, I just want to take this moment, because I won't have much time at the end, to thank this group of people up here. I don't know about you, but they bless me every time they open their mouths. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>
Would you express your appreciation to our choir and our soloists and our instrumentalists? <laughs> All of that hard work has paid off, and we are so grateful for them. As our Advent journey draws to its conclusion, we are wrapping up our sermon series called The Names of Jesus in Advent. We've been looking over the last several weeks at some different names for Jesus that we find in the Nativity accounts. We've explored the meaning of each of those names why that name is attributed to Jesus, and what that name means for us in our relationship with him. At the end of each message, we have been challenged to use that name in our prayers in the coming week. As we wrap things up this morning, our scripture reading is in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, let's find that, John 1, verse 1. Now we know that names in biblical times reveal things about a person's character or their identity. So knowing the names of Jesus helps us to know some things about who Jesus is. We also know that names tell us about how we relate to each other. So knowing the names of Jesus reveals different aspects of our relationship with him. The first Sunday in our series, we looked at the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The second Sunday of Advent focused on the name Son of God. Last week, the name was simply Jesus, which we said is a variation of the Hebrew name Joshua. And that immediately makes us think back to the Old Testament Joshua who led the people of Israel across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. Joseph and Mary were instructed to name their son Jesus. Not because it was an easy name to remember, not because it was a common name at the time, which it was, not because somebody in the family had been named that, but because Jesus would save his people from their sins. As Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 tells us. We said last week that God did not give Jesus the name of Abraham because it would have caused people to think about the covenant that God had made with Abraham to make him into a great nation. <clears throat> Giving Jesus the name of, say, Moses would have caused people to think about the one who had received the law from God and who had given it to the people. Giving Jesus the name of David would have caused people to think about the king who warred and conquered. Because Jesus was not going to be like Abraham. Jesus was going to establish a new covenant. Not just with Israel, but with all who would turn to him in faith. Jesus would not be like Moses. Because he did not come to bring a new legal system. Jesus would certainly not be like David. Because he was not a military leader or a warrior. He was named Jesus because he would do what Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David had all been powerless to do. Save his people from their sins. Today's name for Jesus is found only in two places in the New Testament. One is in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. And the other is in the opening chapter of John's Gospel. Kathy, would you read for us John 1, 1, please? In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The name for Jesus today is Word. In Greek, it translates as Logos, from where we get our word, Logo. Now, we are all familiar with 
logos. We see them every single day. You might think about the five interlocking rings that represent the Olympic Games. You might think of the big yellow M for McDonald's or the red and white bullseye target for target stores. Simply put, a logo is an image that identifies a particular brand associated with a business or an organization. In the United Methodist Church, our logo is the cross and the flame that you see at the bottom of the front of your bulletin. You may have worked someplace that required you to wear the company logo on your shirt. And that simple design, whether it is for Coca-Cola or Apple products or M&Ms or Delta Airlines, tells you what you can expect from that provider. Jesus is the Logos. He is the Word of God. And therefore, He represents who God is and what God does. Jesus tells us and shows us what we can expect from God. From the start, Jesus already existed. John writes, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you read the Nativity accounts in Matthew and in Luke, we see an earthy, historical perspective on the birth of Jesus. John offers us a different perspective. John offers us a more cosmic perspective. John links Jesus, the Word, with God's creative work all the way back to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, it says that God said, let there be light. God called the light day, and the darkness night. In verse 6 it says, God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. God called the space sky. Then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together in one place so dry ground may appear. I think you see the pattern that develops here. The first chapter of Genesis is 31 verses long. In those 31 verses, we are told 10 times God said. Three times that God called. And twice that God blessed. So, out of 31 verses... In 15 of those verses, there are references to God speaking creation into existence. And that speaking was the Word, the Logos. The Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 support this. It says, He, Jesus, the Word, Logos, existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. So the word is creative and is powerful. So what does this word reveal to us then about who Jesus is? We know that Jesus existed in a union of perfect love with the Father and with the Holy Spirit from the very beginning. We know that as God's Word, Jesus is the fullness, the completeness of God's divine nature and being. That Word took on flesh and blood, entered our world 
and thus allowed God to communicate with his people in a different way. In the Old Testament, God communicated through persons such as Moses and Joshua, as well as through the prophets. He also communicated through the Jewish law. But in no sense were Moses or Joshua or the prophets or the priests or the kings the equivalent of God. They spoke for God, but they were not themselves God. Jesus not only speaks for God, but he is himself totally, completely, fully God. Jesus is also God's final word. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to him. He kept the law perfectly. Jesus not only set in motion the final act of God's redemptive plan, but he finished that plan as well. When he declared from the cross, it is finished, there was nothing more that could be added. There was nothing that could be changed in order for people to have a relationship with God. Nothing in history will ever change the finality of Jesus' work on the cross. He is the Word made flesh of the same being and the same substance as the Father. So just like a swoosh on the side of a shoe tells us that the brand is Nike, or a leaping cat on the hood of a car tells us it's a Jaguar, Jesus is the perfect, best, only Word, the Logos, that God means to speak. Which brings us to a point of difference between the Word, or the Logos, and the Word of God, the Bible. For simplicity's sake, when Christians refer to the Bible, we refer to it as the Word of God. But we're talking about Word there with like a lowercase w. When we speak of Jesus as the Word, as the Logos, we're talking about a capital but the difference goes way beyond capitalization. The words of God that are contained in the Old and the New Testaments are not the Logos. They are not of the same being and substance as the Father. They did not exist in the beginning and they were not responsible for for creating all things. Only Jesus is the Logos. What we have in the Bible testifies to Jesus. But he is not the cosmic, eternal Logos. Put another way, we don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus. The Bible is vitally important because it is a type of revelation from God and about God. But the purest expression, the purest form of God's nature is found only in Jesus. What does all this mean then for our relationship with Jesus? Why does knowing Jesus at the, as the Word make any kind of difference. Because it does seem a bit out there, doesn't it? It's, it's some sort of cosmic theological idea kind of floating around out there that's kind of hard to wrap our heads around. Doesn't really seem to have a lot of practical relevance to who we are and how we live, right? Okay, so maybe in some ways, knowing Jesus as the Logos is just for those stuffy, erudite theologians. Or maybe those dry, old, dusty, questioning <clears throat> philosophers. Maybe it's just for them. But then again, God would not have revealed himself as the Word made flesh if it 
was just for a few particular people. No, you see, the word is to all people. And the word is for all people. Even though we acknowledge we have a difficult time trying to grasp this rather abstract concept. When we exist in a relationship with Jesus, we are in connection, we are in communication with the one true God. And so the God who spoke creation into existence in Genesis is the one who is able to still speak to our hearts and our minds. We have access to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 1.3. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. There is nothing that we lack that the word cannot speak and provide for us. So do you need courage? Then let the Logos of God speak that into your heart. Do you need guidance? Then let Jesus speak and direct you. Do you need healing? Then let the eternal word of God declare that in your life. You know, throughout the Gospels, as we follow the story of Jesus, we see him speaking into different types of situations. The word made flesh commanded the wind and the waves to be still. He rebuked evil spirits and demons. He spoke hope and healing to many. He taught and instructed his followers. For the one who opened his mouth and brought forth galaxies, Jesus has no trouble responding to our cares and needs. I mean, if God can speak and create light, then I'm pretty convinced he can handle our anxiety and our stress and our doubts and our confusion. And that means that there is nothing that we cannot survive. There is no tragedy. There is no financial crisis. There is no emotional problem. There is no illness. There is no betrayal. There is no disappointment. There is no accident. Even death, that most final of all calamities, cannot destroy the Christian's hope because we know that Jesus, the Word, the Logos, will speak and He will call us to resurrection life. So no matter what we face, as the Logos, Jesus can speak and bring resolution into every circumstance. So this week, as you pray, as we head towards Christmas Day, practice using that name, Word, or if you prefer, Logos, in your prayers. Every time when you pray and you get ready to say, Jesus, substitute Word or Logos instead. And consider what significance that has in your life. What that word that Logos can accomplish. The fullest, greatest, purest, holiest expression of God is revealed in the Word made flesh. Let us pray. <laughs> word of God who exists and has always existed and always will exist. You are the only one who speaks new life into existence. Every spring bud or bloom, every newborn infant enters this world because you have declared it to be so. And while we may get overwhelmed with all the theological jargon about words and logos and such, the simpler truth is what we have always known. 
that you are always with us and that you have the ability to speak into every situation in our lives. We thank you for the times in our lives when you spoke peace to calm us, when you spoke conviction to reprimand us, when you spoke acceptance to welcome us. You are the word eternal, Jesus. And we ask that you saturate our lives this week with whatever words, commands, directions, and instructions that we need. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3.
again our benediction printed in your bulletin. Let's share these words together. <clears throat> Despite what we see and hear in the world around us, the Word of God will soon arrive. So go from here to love and serve the Lord and anticipate the coming of the Word made flesh. Amen.